I have had ulcerative colitis since 2010, and in 2011, I underwent surgery to form an ileostomy. Uh, I founded a YouTube channel called Ostomize Story and documented two years of my journey with my ostomy and went on national television to talk about my scoma. And um, like I said, now I am Shield Healthcare's ostomy lifestyle specialist. So our first guest is Eric Polzinelli, and he lives just east of Toronto in Canada. He has a permanent ileostomy due to Crohn's disease. And he's had it for just over two years. And he started the veganostomy.ca website in 2013 in order to help ostomates by sharing reviews, tips, and his experiences as an ostomate. He also has a growing YouTube channel and is really active on forums and social media. And his goal is just to continue to offer positive support both online and off. Our second guest is Brian Greenberg, and he lives in Stamford, Connecticut. He also has a permanent ileostomy due to Crohn's disease, and he's had his ostomy for five years. He got involved in the ostomy community when he started the Intense Intestines Foundation. Um, preparing for surgery, he didn't find the information that he was looking for, so he started to um, help patients with Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, and ostomies in a positive way. Um, he'd also like to show those with IBD that you can live your life the way that you want to and do the things that you love. And our last guest is Brett Cromer. He lives in Aurora, Illinois, and he also has a permanent ileostomy due to Crohn's disease. He's had it since 1987 when he was 16 years old, and he joined a UOAA support group when he was 16 and um, now leads a United Ostomy Associations of America support group and also is involved in Youth Rally, a camp for teenagers with bowel and bladder dysfunctions of any, kind, any type, um, and just wants to make sure that anyone who is facing ostomy surgery or is new to having an ostomy knows that they are not alone. So now we're going to start the uh, discussion portion of the webinar. So first of all, uh, Brian, how did you feel when you learned you'd need an ostomy? Well, firstly, thank you very much, Laura, for having me on. I'm very honored to be with the other uh, advocates to help other ostomates out as well. Um, when I first learned to get an ostomy, it was very mixed emotions, I would say. Um, you know, I was definitely fearful of, you know, what life would be like, what it would be like to change an ostomy, go to the bathroom, and all the adjustments I would possibly have to make. But I had also had a very, very long battle for 22 years with Crohn's disease, and the last three before my ostomy were pretty horrific with going to the bathroom 30 times a day, which is painful for a number of reasons, just wiping hurts at that point. So while I was fearful for a lot of reasons and I knew a lot of adjustments would have to be, make, be made, I was also very relieved. I knew that it would help me out, I knew that it would make my life a little bit better, and I knew that it would allow me to live a more pain-free life. That's wonderful. And Eric, did you have that same sense of relief, or how did you feel when you first learned you needed an ostomy? Well, thank you, uh, first of all, for having me here, and I'm uh, honored to be with the rest of you guys. Uh, my experience was actually pretty negative at the beginning when I found out that uh, I was a candidate for surgery because in my mind I felt as if surgery was uh, like a failure, and, you know, it it really hit me hard. I was I was quite devastated. I wasn't expecting surgery despite the fact that I was, you know, sick for so long, but I, you know, I was in a clinical trial and I was hoping that things would be looking better, but when it when I found out that they weren't um, and I was a candidate for surgery, I didn't take it too well at the beginning. Right. Um, and and what helped you kind of take it better as you progressed? So it's funny actually. I, I, I was because I was part of a trial, I actually had a nurse that was, you know, following my case around and she was there in the office with me when I uh, had been speaking to my GI. And she saw that I was visibly upset and you know, it was something she said was, you know, very calming to me and you know, she said, Look, I, I know other people with an ostomy and they're doing great. And that kind of sparked this journey to find out, you know, who these people were, and eventually I, I found plenty of very happy ostomates out there, and that, um, you know, that changed my perspective. That's wonderful. And so, uh, Brett, how did you overcome the fear and unknowns about life with an ostomy? 
That's a good question, Lauren. I didn't get to say uh, thank you for um, uh, hosting as well. I'm honored to be uh, alongside and enjoy getting to know Eric and Brian a little bit too. Um, so it's a good question. How do you uncover the fear and unknowns? It's a little different from when I had my surgery almost 30 years ago. There weren't a lot of resources out there on the internet. There were not a lot of people sharing their stories out there, uh, you know, on YouTube and Facebook. And overcoming the fear and unknowns became about me and my uh, WOCN nurse at the time and my family, because it, my, and my family. There, there was a lot of unknowns. And for me, it was realizing that I was going to be feeling a lot better than I had been being sick with prednisone. And it came one day at a time. I had a pretty lengthy recovery from surgery, but this came from my family and friends telling me it was going to be okay, never allowing me to have a down day, and feeling pretty good right after that surgery um, from the fear of being obstinate. I didn't have a lot of fear, Laura, because I just wanted to feel better. Right, absolutely. I can relate to that. And um, Brian, how did you overcome your fears about the unknown? I think my situation was a little bit similar to Brett's. Um, you know, I think even in the last five years since I've had my ostomy, the internet has helped greatly and, you know, awareness has grown greatly. So it's made life a little bit easier for ostomates. But even five years ago, I wasn't able to find too much information for areas that I wanted to. And I had a lot of fears of would I be able to live a normal life? Would I be able to still climb? Would I be able to still hike, ride my bicycle, you know, do all the things that I love to do? And I actually found a guy by the name of Rob Hill who climbed the seven summits of the world um, with his Crohn's disease and ostomy. And I was devastated until about three days before my surgery until I found his videos. And then all of a sudden I realized, A, I'm not alone. And B, there are also a lot of people out there just like me doing a lot of things and a lot of great things with ostomies too. So it kind of put my mind at ease to know that not only the day-to-day -day lifestyle would be okay, but I'd be able to do all the activities and overcome the ostomy and live a normal life as well. Absolutely, and I always tell people who I talk to um, if they're thinking about getting an ostomy or if they are new to having an ostomy that the more good experiences you have, the more things you do try with your ostomy um, and nothing goes wrong, the more the unknowns seem a lot less scary. So Eric, uh, where did you go for information about ostomies after your surgery? Well, you know, I started actually doing research just before my surgery. I had a, a couple of months in between uh, from the time that I found out that I would be having surgery to the actual time I was in the hospital. And, uh, you know, like I think like most people, I, I hit the Internet. And uh, I did find a lot of uh, people doing YouTube videos and bloggers and, and things like that. More, you know, people who are sharing their experience rather than, you know, an establishment giving information. But I think one of the things that really uh, got me off on the right foot was this information package that the ET nurse at the hospital had given me. And, you know, it had a DVD in there. It had uh, some information about uh, just different lifestyle options when you've got an ostomy. But it also came with uh, an appliance that I could actually put on me before surgery to kind of get a feel for how things would be. And uh, I think that really lowered my stress level uh, when it came to time to actually have the surgery. So, yeah, for the most part, it was just a lot of people sharing their experiences online. And that's where I got a lot of my info. And um, a lot of ostomy companies, actually, companies that sell ostomy supplies, they'll have a lot of information, too. So any of the major manufacturers, you know, Hollister, Coloplast, they'll have information there for patients. And uh, it's really accessible. Absolutely. And I think we're, we're lucky in the way that we... Um had our ostomy surgery now, whereas, um, Brett, where did you go because you had your ostomy surgery 30 years ago um, for information? So uh, it was two things. My They called them ET nurses at the time instead of WCNs. I uh, told my mother about this ostomy group that met at the hospital where I had my surgery. And, of course, I wasn't interested in going. I met with a bunch of old people who are, you know, they're my age now, so everybody's old when you're 16. And that is where I got the majority of my information after surgery. There was a little information available from the manufacturers, but nothing like there is now. And what I found was this group of folks, part of the United Ostomy Associations, that were dealing with exactly the same things that I was dealing with, although they were a little bit older and further on in their life. 
they had a story to tell, and, and, and it wasn't some of those weren't that much different than my story. It was you know, on head crumbs, on prednisone, didn't work, so you have surgery. And we talked about the challenges you face. We talked about how you're going to get over, and everybody there was at a different stage in their journey. Everybody there had a different story, but we all had something in common that we kind of felt like we were all alone. But in that group, surrounded by those folks, I didn't feel all alone. And that's for the first 10 years after my surgery, that's the majority of where I got most of my information. Mm -hmm. and, and it is important, no matter what the demographic of people you're talking to is, to, to feel like you're not alone. Right. So, um, Eric, how did you, how did getting an ostomy change your life? Oh, it, it changed it considerably. Um, you know, I, I had Crohn's disease, I was diagnosed in 2008, so there were many years in between from the time that I had my surgery, and many of those years were spent in bed, um, very sick. So, you know, the moment I had my ostomy, things just completely turned around. So I was able to, you know, eat food, drink water, which was something that was actually pretty painful before, um, and spend time with my family, you know. I got out to do things, so I mean everything just changed. I felt like I was returned back to the life that I had before surgery, and I had a bit of extra motivation to do more of the things that I wanted to do. Absolutely, and um, Brett, how did getting an ostomy change your life? You mentioned you were also pretty sick. Yeah, so you know, senior year, uh, prior to senior year of high school. Um, you know, being in the midst of getting ready to go to college, and I got really sick really fast. It took a semester off of school and was living in the bathroom, wasn't eating anything. Everything was very painful. What that surgery allowed for me was to get off of the medicines um, and also to get a quality of life back. And we talk about that a lot, you know, when we're having conversations. Uh, some folks seem to do everything that they did before they had surgery. Um, some folks are still limited with some things that may have nothing to do with their particular surgery. And some folks have their whole lives ahead of them as well, uh, no matter where you are with this journey. But it, it allowed me to get back to what I was doing, get back to being a high schooler, go into college and date, and get married and get a job, start a family. And I feel pretty confident that while I wasn't so sure at the time, because I just wanted to feel better, my, my little temporary ileostomy is now 30 years old became pretty permanent later, but it allowed me to get back and go snow skiing and go water skiing and swim. And although I made some subtle tweaks to how I went about doing things, it allowed me to get my life back and move on, frankly. So, uh, Brian, what was the biggest adjustment you had to make after your surgery? I think the biggest adjustment for me was more mental than physical, although there are a lot of physical things that patients and ostomates need to adjust to, but mentally being okay with your new body, basically, and the new life you're going to have. Um, you know, there's a certain time period where every time I went to the bathroom, you know, I looked down and I was like, man, why do I have to go to the bathroom this way? There's an you know, ostomy for my right hip. But eventually, you know, mentally, I just accepted it, and I got more and more okay with it, and I realized that this is what was allowing me to live my life again. This is what was allowing me to do all the things that I love and uh, be with my friends. So my biggest adjustment, I think, was more on the mental side to accept not only my new body, but the fact that this new body will allow me to do the things that I want to do in my life. And a follow-up question really quickly. Do you have any um, suggestions for people who are having a difficult time mentally and emotionally accepting their ostomy right away. Yeah, that's, you know, everybody's always different, so it's very hard to go from patient to patient on how they're going to accept their ostomy or deal with their disease. Uh, my attitude has always been that, you know, lying in bed and looking at the ceiling and crying isn't going to help me too much, so i much rather try to do whatever I can to live life to the fullest, whether it be just getting out of bed after a surgery and taking my dog for a walk or going on a long hike or doing a triathlon, you know, find what you love and try to do what you can because that's going to allow you to accept your ostomy so much better. And like you said or earlier, Laura, you know, the more and more you do things, the more and more you're going to be, realize that everything's going to be okay. You know, first it might be a walk, then it might be, you know, a trip into a city, then it might be a hike, and then the more and more things you do without having an accident or a leak or a problem with the ostomy, the more and more you're going to accept it and be okay with the mental side of it as well. Absolutely. And um, Eric, what was your biggest adjustment? 
Yeah, so for me, the biggest adjustment, because I, I have young kids, and um, I think returning back to family life, to me, was the biggest adjustment, and just getting back into the swing of things, you know, finding my role in the family, I think that was the, the biggest hurdle that I had uh, right after surgery, because the mechanics of, of myosomy weren't really an issue. Uh, I got used to that pretty quick, but it was just coming back to, you know, the life that I had basically left when I when I became sick and uh, just you know getting back into the swing of things that was the, the biggest adjustment for me absolutely and although I I can't relate to having children and being sick and then being well I I definitely went through an adjustment period where I was just very used to being sick and I had mentally accepted that my life was going to be um, be with a chronic illness and then um, to have the surgery and feel well, I, I kind of forgot how to be a person who feels well. It was a very weird adjustment for me as well. So, um, Brett, how was your recovery after surgery? You know, so I, I think this answer kind of takes a two-part stage, and it, it is definitely different for everybody, you know, and a lot of it was how how sick you were going into the surgery. So I was pretty sick. I had lost a tremendous amount of weight. And when I came out, I was a, a stubborn 16-year-old who didn't who knew everything and didn't listen to the doctors. So instead of coming home a couple weeks later, um, I came home about six weeks later. I got pneumonia. Uh, it took a long time to get enough strength back to be released from the hospital. And what I took away from that was this was, you know, this was a big deal. I was this was a big deal, but in subsequent surgeries after that. I had much better recoveries because I knew I was going to have surgery coming up. I, I worked to exercise, get myself in shape, make sure I was healthy before I went into the hospital for some follow-up surgeries. And those surgeries, the recovery time from that, because I was healthier, was much less. I got home much quicker. And so I, it was a learning experience for me because the, the, the recovery after that first one was really tough. And I've also run into people that have had the same surgery. It took them a year to recover of what took me six weeks to recover. And so I've had tough recoveries, and I've had really fast recoveries based on the, you know, the, what, what went on with the surgeon and how in shape and, and not sick I was before I had some more surgery. Hmm. And that's kind of a long answer. That's a great point, though. Uh, and Eric, what was your experience with recovery after surgery? Yeah, I think I had a pretty easy recovery, uh, to be honest, um, other than a little blip at the beginning where I had an incision open up uh, after I was released from the hospital, you know, it was it was pretty easy in the sense that I was able to do things, you know, several weeks after. I was on a hike, you know, five weeks after surgery. So, you know, considering where I was before going in, I mean, I made incredible um, strides soon after. But, you know, recovery, it's not something where you could say, in four weeks, you'll be great. For me, I felt like it was, you know, even months after, I just kept on feel, you know, I felt stronger. I felt like I could do more. My body was adjusting. Um, so, you know, it's like an ongoing process. And I, I probably would say it took a good year before I could say I am now, you know, I feel completely strong, fully recovered. I can, you know, do all the things that I want to do without any uh, hesitation. Uh, so I, I feel like recovery at the beginning was very short, but, you know, it, it does stretch a bit longer than that. Absolutely. And I, I always just think back to this nurse I had, and she, she told me a great thing. She said, you know, it will probably be a year until you get your stamina back, but what I want you to do is write five things that are better this week than last week. Because sometimes day to day we can't see our recovery progress, but but week by week or maybe two weeks by two weeks, you start to be able to, to pinpoint how much better you are. Um, but it is sometimes a slow going process that takes patience, definitely. So uh, Brian, what are your hobbies post-surgery and what are you able to do with your ostomy that you weren't able to do before you had surgery? Uh, this is an interesting question for me in particular because the list of hobbies that I have are pretty endless. Um, I was told by a few people who have ostomies who 
don't have the positive attitude that I have that it's going to be very hard for me to do certain things after my ostomy surgery and I'm not going to be able to work my core out or anything like that and I just wasn't really going to accept that. I was going to make sure that I wanted to live the life that I was intended to live and you know I've always had the mentality that if I wanted to do something that would have been in my life if I wasn't a Crohn's patient or if I wasn't an ostomy, you know, I still want to try to do it with the ostomy. And I found that pretty much everything that I wanted to do, I could. You know, I hike, I ski, I climb, I kayak, I, I go for walks with my dogs, I'm a triathlete now, so I swim, I bike, I run. Um, it really allows me to do pretty much everything. Um, there's a certain level of planning and preparation that has to go into either of these activities because if I don't plan and prepare properly, uh, I might not have the right tools or um, products around or just hydration, nutrition, etc. But I found that pretty much with the right planning and preparation, I'm able to do all of the activities that I loved before and enjoy them even more now after. Right, absolutely. And um, and Brett, what are your hobby, hobbies post surgery, and um, what are you able to do now that you maybe wouldn't have been able to do before surgery? Okay, so you know, before surgery was really um, in the prime of you know high school and soccer and swimming and tennis and all these particular sports that just came to a grinding halt when this really nasty diagnosis with Crohn's hit. And what the surgery allowed me to get back and do was, you know, we talked a little bit about quality of life. It allowed me to do everything that I did before with a couple of, uh, you know, a couple of little hit, you know, changes in my routine when we go skiing or when I go, you know, the first time we water skiing was an adventure, but nobody stood in my way. The only person standing in the way of doing that was me, but I had to jump back in with both legs and do. And, I found myself kind of enjoying those things even more because I wasn't sure that I was going to be able to do any of that, any of that before. But with with encouragement of my family and friends and some pushing of myself, I've gotten back to do everything and more uh, that I couldn't do when I was when I was really really sick. That's great. So, um, Eric, do you tell people in your life about your ostomy, and if so, how do you like to do it? I do, yes. I'm actually not, I'm not shy at all when it comes to talking about my ostomy or even my Crohn's disease for that matter. And, you know, I, I guess it depends on the situation. I don't outwardly start talking about my ostomy, if, you know, if it's not appropriate, but I, I certainly am open to talking about it at great lengths. Uh, but one, one of the things that I find actually really helps to break the ice is um, wearing, you know, like ostomy awareness apparel. So, you know, I've got a shirt that says, ask me about my ostomy. Uh, I've got another one that says, ask me about my Crohn's disease. So those are a good way for people to come to me and say, hey, you know, tell me about that. And, you know, it kind of breaks the ice and then I can go on and, and talk about it. And, you know, it, it tends to be a, a very positive conversation uh, regardless of who I'm talking to. So, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm totally not uh, not shy about talking to people about it. That's great. And um, and Brett, do you tell people in your life about your ostomy and how do you like to do it? So I do it and this has been a little bit of a journey for me um, from when I was 16 and eager to test this out with my teenage friends. Um, a few of them pretty close and found pretty quickly that it uh, it wasn't quite as accepted as I thought it would be and I learned pretty quick who my close friends were and then on into college, kind of went through the same adventure again, told a lot of people about it so I could let people know, I wanted to kind of get my story out. And as I grew into, you know, a working age, found myself not speaking about it so much um, on, a, on a working perspective. And then I found out about this camp that we're going to do, and I watched these teenagers come never afraid to share their story with just about anybody, and it really challenged me to get a, be a little bit more open about it. So halfway through this journey, you know, 15 years in, I really became a lot more open about things. Not so much at work, but in, in my regular life, because I found it a way to do a little bit of self, you know, reflection and self-healing. But the more folks you tell about it, the more folks that you find are, are, are dealing with it themselves or know somebody that are dealing with it, and you can extend your outreach. So how do I like to do it? It takes every different form. You have to know your audience a little bit. I do not wear, I have an ostomy right on my forehead very often, um, but boy, once you get somebody interested, once you get somebody interested in talking about it, I'm, I, I love to tell the story and how it's 
has positively impacted my quality of life in the hope that it will have an impact on my life as well. Absolutely. And I, I've found, um, just with sharing my own experiences, that, um, you know, once you have been through something that was painful or difficult, you have this amazing capacity for empathy. And um, even if someone's struggle is not related to yours, you still have this ability to be empathetic, to, to listen with an open mind and, and an open heart. And I think that that is something that really our illnesses and our experiences have given us. So, um, Brian, uh, the other two already kind of talked about the reactions that they've gotten, but I want to ask you, what type of reaction from people do you usually get when you do tell them about your ostomy? Uh, in the five years that I've had my ostomy, I would say about 99.9% .9 of the reactions that I've gotten have all been positive. Uh, I'm a marketing major in college, so I actually did market research even before I got my ostomy and asked friends, you know, what would it be like if one of your friends had an ostomy? You know, I asked the friends that are girls, you know, what would happen if a, a guy came up to you and said, you know, I have an ostomy? And all of them said, yeah, we wouldn't care as long as it make you healthy and allowed you to, you know, be with us and have fun, then it's not a big deal at all. One of my fondest memories from the foundation that I started was a, a comedy show that we did early on, and we had about 150 people at this comedy show. And you know, I, I did my little spiel before, and I told everybody, you know, I asked, sorry, I asked everybody, you know, how many of you have gone to the bathroom today? And of course, 100% of the audience raised their hand. And I just told them, well, I just go to the bathroom a little bit differently, and I explained what an ostomy was. And I asked them, you know, once again, is everybody all right if I want to go to the bathroom this way a little bit differently? And once again, everybody raised their hand. So, yes, we do go to the bathroom a little bit differently, but I've always found that if the person who has the ostomy has a positive attitude about it and broaches the subject in a positive way, then normally the person receiving that message will, will be positive about it too. And I've never had a problem. Like I said, most people have good reactions. And to be honest, if I ever did have a bad reaction to it, then they're probably the type of person that I wouldn't want in my life anyway. Absolutely. So, um, Eric, I especially want to ask you this, but uh, could you tell us a little bit about what you eat and how you stay hydrated? Yes. Yeah. Thanks for asking. Actually. Um, so yeah. I mean, obviously, the the name of my website is Vegan Awesome, and it's it is that for a reason. It's because I eat a plant based diet, and that was actually one of my concerns before having my ostomy was how would it affect my diet? And so, you know, it's been a it's been quite a journey from after my surgery to now. But generally speaking, I tend to eat a very whole food diet, um, obviously plant-based, and uh, you know I include a lot of uh, grains and legumes, fruits, vegetables, you name it, into my diet. And uh, you know to keep hydrated, I tend to always have some water with me, uh, just on my desk or in the car. And I, I tend to just throw in a bit of salt sometimes, or I'll have like a pre-made powder, like an electrolyte drink that I'll put in there. Uh, and that's to help replenish some of the electrolytes. And uh, I'll usually flavor my water with either apple cider vinegar or uh, lemon juice. And um, another thing that I like to do is just I tend to eat a lot of water-rich foods. So a lot of fruits, tomatoes, for example, watermelons, those are all good things that I, that I tend to include in my diet. And it sort of reduces the need to have water, you know, just out of a glass all the time. Right, absolutely. Um, that's a great point, that you don't have to just drink your hydration. You can also eat things that are rich in water. And um, Brian, I'm especially interested in how you stay hydrated because you are so active. Um, so do you have any tips for um, eating or staying hydrated? Uh, I think Eric is right on the ball with eating actually hydrates you quite a bit, and people don't realize that. Um, some of the things that I do is I love to juice. I actually blend a lot of vegetables uh, in a, a, a juicer each and every day, and that I seem to allows me to take in the nutrients not only from them but also the liquid from the vegetables also. Uh, a big thing is I do is I also add electrolytes to my water like Eric does as well and make sure that throughout the day I'm, I'm drinking something with some substance at least so then my small intestine has something to grab onto is if I drink regular water it generally goes straight through me and if I drink Gatorade it's too sugary and it just it's disgusting for my body so I just can't intake it. Uh, another thing that I do which I have found a 
found works very well is I actually drink a water-based protein shake at times also because that has a lot of nutrients and a lot of electrolytes, minerals, and vitamins that I need too. And once again, that's kind of water-based and it has something for my small intestine since I don't have a colon to grab onto and intake some of the uh, liquid from there also. Those are great tips. Thank you. So, uh, Brett, what is your biggest accomplishment with your ostomy? And can you tell us a little bit about your experience? Sure. So I think it's kind of two parts. So I think one of the biggest accomplishments, you know, from when I was a teenager being 16 is, uh, is dealing with this big uh, change in your life of discovering who you are, uh, living through this ostomy. Um, some people, it is a, you know, it's a life-changing experience. And some folks really don't deal with it very well. So I, I, I think just stopping and taking a look at having a surgery, dealing with it, having a good support group around me, and then going on and living a very uh, productive, accomplished life is, is a giant piece of this. But halfway into my journey, it really, really uh, hit me that there was an opportunity to do even more and spread the word of, hey, being living with an ostomy is okay. It, it, it's great. You can get on with your life no matter what's going on, and you don't have to feel all you're alone, that you're all alone. And it's becoming involved in this youth rally camp that we do for kids ages 11 to 17 with any sort of bowel or bladder diversion, no matter what they're dealing with, from, uh, from rectal cancer to spina bifida to Crohn's, you know, colitis and UC. And it has had a profound impact on me as far as being more open about it, getting the word out and finding more kids and finding more folks uh, to help. And if I didn't have the surgery, I would not be affiliated with that group. I would not have had that experience and would not have had the experience to share that with as many folks than I have. And I, I chalked it up there as one of my biggest accomplishments. Right. Well, that is amazing, being able to help kids um, cope and being able to learn from them as well. And also, Brian, I do want to ask you this question as well. So could you tell us a little bit about your biggest accomplishment with your ostomy? Uh, yeah, my biggest accomplishment with my ostomy actually was very recent in August. Um, I actually completed a 70.3 half Ironman, which includes a 1.2 mile swim, a 56 mile bike ride, and a 13.1 mile run. And you know, a lot of people told me I was crazy, but I was able to do it. I got out of the swim, I checked my ostomy, it was fine at the first transition area. I biked 56 miles, I checked my ostomy again, and it was fine. And from that point on, I pretty much knew that it was going to be okay. And you know, crossing the finish line, knowing that I was able to do it with my Crohn's, with an ostomy, um, it was a pretty big accomplishment, one that I'm very happy that I did, and I can't wait to do another one. And the messages that I've gotten from other ostomates and other triathletes with ostomates who, who haven't done that distance yet and we're all nervous about it have been great and supportive, and I'm really glad that I was able to help people out in that way and show them that a lot can still be done with an ostomy if you plan to prepare right and train right as well. Absolutely, and that's some, it's some funny you mentioned that because um, I find myself at least having a, quite a platform doing things not only for myself but just to say I've done them with my ostomy to help people feel like they can do the things that they want to do in their lives. I don't know if you do the same thing, but I feel kind of inspired and motivated to do things just so I can tell people, hey, you want to run a half, or you want to do a half Ironman, sure you can, because Brian did it, or, you know, so I think that that's wonderful. Thank you. So, um, this one is for all of you. We want to kind of quickly do the last three slides, just because we want to um, answer some questions. Please, if you are uh, watching and listening, please feel free to type in your questions in the box, and um, we will get to those shortly. So, uh, Brett, what's the biggest challenge or struggle you've had to overcome with your ostomy? Uh, so, Laura, I'll, I'll take this back to when I was 16 and had my surgery. And really, to me, the biggest challenge or struggle was getting through that first surgery, um, you know, figuring out who I was going to be with this ostomy, not letting it particularly define me, but you know, finding my identity with this, where I fit back into you know, my friends and school and working on through college. And I was able to overcome that and do it. I've had a few surgeries afterwards, and each time it's gotten a little bit better. And again, you know, 10 years into this journey, discovering that, hey, this is great. 
it's not so bad, and it's going to be permanent. So just the physiosocial side of realizing that you're going to have this forever, and once you've figured out that it's going to be okay, you're not alone, and life is going to go on, and you can accomplish great things, that it's not such a big challenge or struggle. But that was my biggest challenge back when I was 16. It hasn't been much of a challenge since. That's fantastic. That's amazing. Um, Eric, what about you? What's your biggest challenge or struggle you've had? Yeah, you know, I've, I probably consider myself really lucky that I haven't had any major issues with my uh, stoma. But, uh, you know, I've had the odd skin problem here and there. And I think it's important that, you know, if you're having those kind of challenges to talk to a stoma nurse, first of all, and try to get it taken care of right away. I think if you leave those things, they just perpetuate, they get a lot worse, and then you really have a challenge on your hand. But as far as, you know, I don't think I've, I would ever describe myself as having struggled with my ostomy. I think I've had a very positive experience. Oh, that's great to hear. And um, Brian, have you had a, a struggle, and how have you overcome it? I haven't had many physical struggles um, yet with my ostomy. I had a little bit of a problem with my proctectomy last year, which took a, quite a bit of time to heal, and I had to spend a lot of time in bed and basically laying on my side. I think the biggest struggle that I had is being okay with myself. Um, you know, when I first got my ostomy, I was a 28-year-old single guy, and I've had a few relationships since then, but just being okay with my ostomy being there and knowing that, you know, for the most part, all the girls that I've ever dated are fine with it. But sometimes, you know, I look down and I say to myself, well, I'm not a normal guy. I have an ostomy and are, are these girls going to be okay with it? But they all are. So I think I've had to overcome that mental hurdle that it's there, but other people that I date are, who are going to be in my life are going to be 100% fine with it as well. Absolutely. So um, this is also for all of you. You're all really involved in the ostomy community. Uh, what inspired you and why was it important to you to get involved? So I'll start with Brett again. All right, so I think this is another uh, two-part answer. Um, first, me going to that support group, uh, that United Ostomy Association support group when I was 16, and while I joked that my mother drug me kicking and screaming to the old people's group, it was very inspirational to me. I didn't realize it at the time, but I was also inspiring some of those older folks that said, hey, if a 16-year-old can deal with it, I ought to be able to deal with it too and make, out, make the best of it and get on with my life. So I think there was that part of it, and it, it just encouraged me to stay involved in a leadership role with that group. But about 15 years into that, uh, we had a young 12-year-old that came to our group that went to this camp and said, you need to come and be a counselor at this camp. And he bugged me and bugged me for three summers to come and be a part of this camp. I got to go be a counselor, and these kids are amazing. And they're the ones that inspire me to get out and get the word out and do conferences and encourage other people to get the word out so we can grow our camp even bigger than it is now. Um, That's wonderful. So, uh, Brian, what inspired you? I think what inspired me the most was just the network around, you know, ostomies have this stigma that we're trying to get rid of them, that they're, you know, for the elderly and those are the only people that have them but I found very quickly when I was in the community that there are a lot of young people that have them as well and I kind of wanted to spread the word that life is going to be okay and that you could do a lot with things the ostomy and you could still do a lot of the activities that you love so I wanted to try to get out a positive motivating message that things are going to be okay no matter what age you have an ostomy at and you can still do a lot in your life with an ostomy, whether it be getting out of bed and walking the dog, whether it be a triathlon or just hanging out with friends. Everything's going to be okay. And I wanted to make sure that, you know, teenagers who get ostomies or young adults that get ostomies or just regular adults that get ostomies know that everything's going to be okay and they're going to be able to do the things that they love. Absolutely. That's an important message. And Eric, uh, what inspired you? Yeah, so I was I was inspired, you know, by people like you, Laura. To be honest, um, making YouTube videos and sharing their story online, and you know, I realized that you know a single video can really change your whole perspective on things. And I wanted to give back to the Ostomy community by doing you know some of the same thing because I think it's important, first of all, to show that you know things are going to be okay. It's not. <laughs> You know, I know we get to have this mental image of, of what it's going to be like, but it's really not like that, I think, for the vast majority of, of ostomates. And, you know, for the most part, it's a very positive uh, change from where they were at, you know, if they had IBD and, um, you know, 
for a lot of people it saved their lives. So, you know, hearing these stories, um, sharing these stories, that you know, always keeps me motivated and, and inspired to do more. Oh, well, that's wonderful, and thank you. I appreciate you telling me so. Um, and our last question, also really quickly, just all of you. So, um, Eric, if you could give someone with who's new to having an stoma one piece of advice, what would it be? Yeah, it, for me, it has to be attitude. Uh, if you go into this, you know, with a defeated attitude, it, it's just it's not going to get better. You have to change your perspective a bit and again you know reaching out to other people could be what triggers that change but once you get into the mindset that you're going to move forward with it and you're going to you know achieve what you want to achieve despite of having these challenges everything changes for you and I think you you, you set yourself up to have a much better life. Absolutely one of my favorite quotes that's gotten me through a lot of hardships is if you can't change your situation change your attitude so I completely agree. So, uh, Brett, what is one piece of advice you would give to someone who's new to having a stoma? Oh, it's so tough to narrow this down to one piece, but we talk a lot about it in our group. Hey, we talk a lot about it in our group is you know, realizing that you're not alone and that it's okay. You, you know your body better than anybody. You know what's working, what's not working. We kind of have this little phrase, you know, if it doesn't look right, seem right, smell right, something's probably wrong, and don't be afraid to ask for help. And don't wait to ask for help. You don't have to tackle this alone. Raise your hand. Go see your nurse. Go see your doctor. Call one. Call somebody in your support group. And don't be afraid to do so. Because it's not easy for everybody to do that. Most of us want to kind of do it ourselves. Don't be afraid to ask for help. Absolutely. And and I would just like to add to, to be tenacious. Really, you, you understand your body best. Um, I had an experience where I... I wasn't feverish, I didn't have signs of an infection, um, but I knew something was wrong because I had so much pain just walking and that was something new. And um, so instead my surgeon wouldn't see me so I went to my general practitioner. Uh, she ordered a CT and it turned out I had a fluid collection inside of me the size of a grapefruit. So um, I would just like to say be tenacious and if you do feel like something's wrong, it, more than likely there probably is. So be tenacious and get the help that you do need. Um, and lastly, Brian, what is what is one piece of advice you would give? I think Brett and Eric have, have nailed the two biggest things. Um, I kind of think positivity and going into the surgery positive is a big thing because if you come out of that surgery and you wake up and all of a sudden you see the ostomy on your right hip or left hip and, and you're negative about it, you're just not going to recover right, you're not going to have the right mindset and you're, you're never going to be able to enjoy life the way you want and accept your ostomy and I think Brett nailed it on the head too to reach out to others who have ostomies and, and talk to them because networking is so important and people need to know that they're not alone. Whatever age they are, there's another ostomy out there that they can relate to and connect with and I think you know with social media and Twitter and Facebook and everything you're able to reach these people pretty easily and you're able to reach us also. I know Eric and Brett and I are also all reachable. So I think networking is the biggest thing and you know, feel comfortable to reach out to anybody and ask them a quick question because we're all here to help and each other and you know, we are a community. Absolutely. And and that's a great segue because the next slide, um, please for those of you attending, um, if you would like, write these write these down or take a screenshot. Um, this is where Eric, Brian, Brett, and I can be reached, and we are more than happy to answer any questions we don't get to in this session. Um, and so I'm just going to leave this slide up while we start the question and answer. So please feel free to type in your questions now. We already have some. So um, one question is, I want to start swimming again, but I'm still feeling afraid. Any advice? Uh, I guess I'll take this one because I've swam probably about a hundred miles in the last few months. Um, <laughs> swimming with an ostomy can be very scary, um, especially in the pool setting because if, if something goes wrong, you know, you're going to be to blame to ruining that pool for the day or, or week. But I have done countless swims since I've started training for the tri half, tri half Ironman and I've never had one problem with my ostomy. You know, I've always made sure it's on there strong. I've always made sure I've gone into the pool with a good ostomy and, and a good uh, adhere. But, uh, you know, I've never had a problem. So I think just take it slow, you know, do a few laps, then get out, check it, 
go back in, do a few more laps, check it, and you'll realize that everything's fine. And uh, you know, another thing that I do also is I have a wrap that kind of really secures my ostomy to my hip and, and keeps it very you know centered. So I would recommend making sure that the ostomy is is pretty tight to your body and that um, it's there and and you have a good one, good fresh one on as well. Absolutely. And I would just really quickly like to add um, an ostomate told me this, and I was like, that is a brilliant idea. Why haven't I thought about that? So. Um, this person was also worried about swimming and so at first she didn't go into a pool she just drew a bath and sat in the bath for about 30 minutes and checked her seal and it made her feel confident that she could be in a pool in a public situation and her seal would be just fine because she had already submerged it totally underwater so I thought that was a really great tip from her um, okay so our second question is from a WOCN, um, and she wants to know how can we better help in ostomy care and recovery? Does anyone have any suggestions? Oh, yeah, I'll, I can, I'll offer it. I could jump I'll, in I'll, here, I'll, or, or Brett. <laughs> no, go ahead, Eric. Okay. Yeah, you know, I, I had quite a few uh, home care nurses actually come. Uh, visit me after my surgery, and I had some really good ET nurses that I had to actually go out and visit. But I think it's it's really important that the nurses know about the products. So not like don't be content with just knowing about you know what a wafer is, what a bag is, and then end it at that. Because I know a lot of the time you could help solve a problem that could have a very easy solution, but if you're not aware of what options are available, then you might not be able to suggest it. So, for example, something like pouch deodorants or even gelling sachets or, or um, uh, gelling products that you could put inside of a pouch to help jellify any kind of liquid output, you know, that could go a long way to, towards helping somebody, for example, who might have an odor issue or leaks. So, you know, knowing about the products I think is very important. And also, just as another side thing, is when somebody tells you that they've got an ostomy, don't tell them that you feel sorry for them because it's not it's not really something to feel sorry about. I think if you want to uh, feel sorry about anything, it's the fact that they got sick in the first place. But the ostomy is is completely separate, and I th I don't think there's anything to be sorry about uh, for having an ostomy. Absolutely. Uh, I, I do want to add two things really quickly. First of all, I appreciate you uh, talked about that because. I actually had a surgeon tell me, I'm sorry that this happened to you so young, and that I, I had never even thought about how young I was um, until that person said that to me, and then I was like, oh, why me? I'm so young. So it kind of put a negative spin on my thought process that wasn't there prior. So really just, just um, kind of approaching the ostomy as something that saved their lives. Um, and then also I just want to say, for me, a WOCN, would be most helpful also uh, knowing more about the psychosocial, the emotional struggles that someone who is new to having an ostomy uh, deals with. So just because some people will not talk to other people about their ostomy, so a WOCN or a nurse is the only person they'll talk to. So just being able to say, hey, I'm here, if you have any questions about exercise, lifestyle, swimming, intimacy, please feel free to ask me. Uh, just having an open dialogue, I think, is really important. And then um, we have, I think, one or two more questions. So um, Ben asks, how do you empty your pouch in a restroom away from home? I'd love to answer this. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> So I've actually got a few tips for um, for public washrooms. For me, I like to uh, kneel usually when I'm at home to empty my pouch. But in a public washroom, I don't feel too comfortable doing that. So what I generally do is um, I'll either squat over the bowl or I'll try to get as low to the ground as I can to empty. But I think what comes in really handy is because the toilet paper generally that you find in these public washrooms are like really thin and cheap and they don't hold very well, I like to rip you know, several sheets of that and then just place them in my pocket and then that way when I've emptied the pouch I can actually just grab some of that toilet paper and then very easily clean the outlet without having to fumble with their dispenser because a lot of the time it's it's a challenge. Um, if you actually have toilets that auto flush, take a piece of toilet paper and cover the little sensor on that because that 
tends to be very annoying. And then I'll just go through my regular routine. So I'll lay down toilet paper uh, along the bottom where the water is so that there's no splashing, and then I'll just go on about my business that way. Well, well, that's a great tip. Um, yes, I hate when it flushes before I'm done. Um, and I do it a little bit differently. I stand and I empty into the toilet, but I make sure that there is toilet paper on the water part of the toilet bowl so that it doesn't splash up. Um, and I think the last question that we have time for is, uh, will the presentation be available for new optimists or for people who did not attend this webinar session? And the answer is yes, we will record it and it will be um, on our site. You can see at the very bottom, shieldhealthcare.com slash ostomylife. That's where it will appear. We'll probably have that up within the next day or two. And so you'll be able to access it and share it and um, see this whenever you would like. So I just want to thank everyone for attending. I hope this was helpful. If you did not get your question answered, you feel free to contact any of us. Um, and I also would just really like to thank all three of you for coming on and talking with us. Um, it was wonderful to hear your stories and what you have to say. And I'm just very thankful that you are resources in this community and thankful that you participated today. Thank you very much for having us, Laura. It was really great to be a part of this. Yep, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Laura. This was great. <laughs> Have a good rest of your day, everyone.